I'm sure people watching at home can now sense the atmosphere here at Flemington. It's, it's very exciting, yet a time of great reverence that that excitement still comes through. And interesting that the Holy Father's motorcade is being escorted appropriately on Flemington Racecourse by four horses. They don't look like thoroughbreds to me, but nonetheless. Well, they, they could well be, Mark, because uh, many of the horses that are used for uh, uh, duties such as um, the, uh, the stewards, um, the gentlemen who ride around the, in the red coats at the race course, and many of the horses in the, the police establishment are former race horses. Is it so? There's a couple of well-known old greys uh, doing police work and clerk of the course work. Well, I know when the Holy Father was at uh, North Altona today answering questions put to him by the children at the school of St Leo the Great, he was asked about his sporting interests and he did mention soccer, but I didn't hear anything said about racing. No, he was a, he was a, a very skilled goalie and he had a young boy in that class, uh, grade four at St Leo's, who apparently even was pushed forward by his classmates as uh, also a pretty good goalie. Maybe there's a future Pope out there at St. Leo's, Mark. <laughs> well, do you laugh, but what about Karl Wojtyla? I think we need a Pope who kicks girls rather than stops them. Yeah. There were some beautiful questions asked this morning. One, one small child asked him, uh, how, do you, how do you find your way around the rooms in the Vatican? And he switched that immediately and said, rooms, stanza. I don't know about the rooms, but you were a room. Ah, yes. You were a room in the temple. <laughs> this is the skill of the good pastor, Bruce. Yes. Turn the question to your own advantage. Yes. yes, and one of the questions also asked, I think, was how many countries have you visited? And uh, the Holy Father said he couldn't really remember. He'd been to so many, but in fact he has been to more than 30 uh, countries. And uh, he is certainly a symbol of unity for many, many people. That really has always been the key to the papal ministry, the service of unity, which is quite a task. This uh, Pope John Paul, Johannes Paul II, I notice he signs himself as, is going about it with a zeal and an urgency the like of which we've never seen before. That's true of him, I think that sense of urgency. You go back four popes and we, we never saw him. I think too since he was shot that sense of urgency has become greater as if time is short yeah. and there's so much to be done in a short time. I think too he's very conscious of the coming of the year 2000 and the need to do so much before the end of this second Christian millennium. Yes. Uh, one of the little boys asked him this morning, Father, if, well, Father could you show, me, show us where you got shot? And, uh, did he really? And he showed yeah. him. And, uh, did he really? <laughs> yeah. I think well, his finger is a convenient exhibit. Mm -hmm. The yeah. rest of him might be rather more difficult to get at. Well, he did. He pointed to the spot. He pointed. He said, I think there. <laughs> he pointed to his tummy. I, I think there. He, he wasn't sure about it. Oh, so, I, uh, well, I know it was there. The face of modern Australia. I noticed the sisters there too, Bruce. There. These, these papal occasions, certainly in Rome at least, are always tremendous moments for the sisters particularly, I think. Preparation music. We're so privileged to be able to sit in the comfort of our own homes, wherever we are, and yet be so close, so tied in to the symbolism and the solemnity of this Mass. Can you have the same feeling if you were way at the back there on Flemington Racecourse? I think not. I, it, the feeling is different. There is always something, I think, of, in being there. There's a, an electricity, a magic in the air, I think. But a moment like this shows us what a, a, a tremendous medium television is. It's a different kind of experience from being there, but uh, 
but a marvellous way to share in the moment of this kind. Well, the father has mentioned many times how uh, important he sees these various uh, media forms to this work he has to do. And he himself, of course, is so skilled in the use of them. <laughs> so he is. He has on the aeroplane with him, travelling as a part of the entourage, the director of Vatican Radio, the director of Vatican Television, and the editor of Le Servatore Romano. Mm. That's uh, his acknowledgement of uh, his helpers. Are we all his disciples in the media? And I'm sure at this particular stage we would like to say a very good afternoon and welcome to the many, many disabled and sick people at home or in hospital. And we know that you're watching every minute of this great event and I'm sure you can feel the atmosphere as we can here at Flemington today. Yes, uh, that's true and the Holy Father knows that when he gives the blessing at the end that he's blessing everybody who's watching, whether they're at Flemington Racecourse or wherever they are. Later on, uh, we'll be seeing um, 114 people who'll be receiving communion from the Holy Father. And there are no VIPs among them. They've been selected by parish priests, some from the migrant community, and we will give you more detail about some of these people as that time draws near. Two other names occur during these masses, acolytes, Father Mark. Well, an acolyte is, uh, is a general assistant, really. He's the sort of uh, minister who will carry the candles and uh, bring the, the water and wine to the Pope. Uh, in the older times, and, and still in many Catholic churches, we would have spoken of altar boys. But they don't always have to be boys. They can be uh, big boys, as it were. Even, dare I say, in some places, girls. But they are acolytes. Uh, people who help at the altar in, in a whole variety of ways. A lot of these terms are confusing. They're, 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 they sound so grand and so obscure, but to they, they really serve to describe quite uh, simple and, and necessary tasks. What's the difference between an acolyte and a special minister? A special minister is the term usually applied to, to people who help in the distribution of communion. So it's a special minister of Holy Communion or a special minister of the Eucharist. Uh, what you'll see in a mass of this kind, particularly one so, so large, uh, on so large a scale, is a whole variety of people performing a whole variety of different tasks, from the Pope right down to the acolytes and, and uh, the policemen even in this context. And there you have a, a marvellous image of the church. Everyone contributing something, put it all together, and you've got the one action. That's why this mass is the best gives you the best insight into what the church is really uh, on about and what she's like within. And that's a, a pretty big change, isn't it, to say 20 years ago even? I think 20 years ago the emphasis was more upon what the priest did. That's right. That uh, often still when people talk about the church, what they mean in fact is the clergy or the Vatican. But you, you'll see here just how many people really do take an active part. We just saw the choir, uh, a huge choir. Now all of those uh, are ministers of the community in a moment like this. In other words, servants. That was the point I was making earlier of the efforts by individual people and small groups who've made their contribution to give their mass some special quality. There's no two the same. Mm. And I think too, in a moment like this, we can be focusing so strongly upon the great man, upon the Pope, that we could forget all the others all the little people who are, who are so crucial to this moment, but also to the life of the church generally. There's a great shot that gives us a perspective of this mass, the Flemington Race Course, close to the adjacent Miribanong River, and the pulsating commercial heart of Melbourne as a backdrop. That, that image of the church that Mark was talking about was one that the Pope himself was very much at pains to point out this morning when he, he spoke to the Catholic educators at the entertainment centre. He was speaking of education as a, a collaborative effort between laity, clergy, religious, parents and so on. 
and it's uh, precisely that image which is, is realised in the mass with people participating in a variety of ways.
salvation. back to your places. If you stay there, it will be absolutely impossible to uh, expedite the distribution of Holy Communion. Those people in the centre roadway, you must keep that roadway perfectly clear. The line of police there are to now help you to move back to your places immediately. Him, the God of Peace, written especially for this papal tour, and the music by Chris Wilcock, words by Tony Kelly. A hymn that's becoming very familiar as we watch the progress of His Holiness through the Australia. Now with me is Father Mark Coleridge, and uh, a quick word, Mark, just as to the start of the procession. Yes, there we have the the thurifer leading off the procession and there of course is the Holy Father himself with the now familiar crozier, the crucifix in his right hand.
the entrance song, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. And as the Pope moves to the altar, he will first incense the cross, then the Gospel book, and finally the altar by moving around it, accompanied by the deacon and the master of ceremonies. And there is the sight from our helicopter. With the Holy Father on the podium, there are the bishops of Victoria, including, of course, the Archbishop of Melbourne, Archbishop Little, but as well visiting prelates from the Vatican, including Cardinal Casaroli, the Secretary of State, and then bishops visiting from around the world, including the Archbishop of Armagh, Cardinal Thomas O'Fee, the Primate of Ireland. Also concelebrating, there are hundreds of priests, not on the podium, but on ground level, just in front of the podium. No doubt the wind will be a slight problem, but uh, I'm sure, as in the face of any kind of weather, His Holiness will continue as if there was no problem at all. The canopy which you can see typifies the large red hat often worn by the Holy Father and on this occasion its movement of waves of peace. Accompanying the Holy Father now we have on the right Monsignor McGee, the Pontifical Master of Ceremonies who is from Northern Ireland and on his right Stuart Hall, a deacon from Melbourne. The vestments which the Holy Father wears for these great masses that he celebrates in the various cities, he leaves at the city as a memento of the occasion. Mark, I'm just wondering if you could briefly describe the movement of the incense and uh, what it signifies. Again, the incense is symbolic of the presence of God, that this is no ordinary gathering, is our faith, that God is here and to recognize his presence, his presence particularly in the ministers of the altar uh, and in the, the gifts that will be brought to the altar. Uh, so the Holy Father then moving around the altar, which again is symbolic and to be reverenced and symbolic of the reverence as a symbol of the presence of God, the presence of the Lord Jesus in our midst. But present also in the gathering in the whole community. And very shortly will have the greeting from the Holy Father. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace be with you. And the Roman Catholic Archbishop of Melbourne, Archbishop Little, will now extend a welcome to the Holy Father. We have come here on pilgrimage from many parts, from different backgrounds. We are eminently a Eucharistic community. Your family has gathered to celebrate with you. Together, we are carrying on a particularly Australian tradition. Our 
Australian Catholic origins are steeped in the Eucharist. The Mass has always been for us the basis and centre of our Catholic community, the source and summit of our whole Christian life. At the Eucharist, we ask the Lord to make us grow in love together with his servant and our Pope, John Paul II. Thank you very much indeed for wishing to celebrate this Mass with us. We can best express our welcome and our thanks by joyfully celebrating this Eucharist together. Please remember us now and always. The welcome to the Holy Father extended by Archbishop Little. And we now await the beginning of the Mass. The Pope embraces the Archbishop there with the kiss of peace, the sign of, of true unity in the Church, the unity of the pastors. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, it is with heartfelt joy that we have come together at this table of the Lord. We are many, a great assembly of men, women and children, each with skills and talents and a story to tell. We are one, a people, bonded to the Father and to each other before celebrating together our oneness in Christ, let us recall our need for the Father's forgiveness, for he is full of gentleness and compassion. Everlasting life.
Let us pray. God, our Father, your Son promised to be with all who gather in his name. Make us aware of his presence among us and fill us with his grace, mercy, and peace so that we may live in truth and love. Grant this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. That's the end of the introductory rites, the preliminaries, and now begins the liturgy of the word it's called really a conversation between God and his people he speaks to us and we speak back to him a reading from the prophet Ezekiel the Lord says this I am going to take you from among the nations and gather you together from all the foreign countries and bring you home to your own land. I shall pour clean water over you and you will be cleansed. I shall cleanse you of all your defilement and all your idols. I shall give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I shall remove the heart of stone from your bodies and give you a heart of flesh instead. I shall put my spirit in you and make you keep my laws and sincerely respect my observances. You will live in the land which I gave your ancestors you shall be my people, and I will be your God. Now the response to the word of God that, that has just been proclaimed and to which we have just listened. And it was read by a lay person, Elizabeth Blackmore. The soloist here is John Caddy from the choir of St. Patrick's Cathedral.
We've been listening to the responsorial psalm sung by John Caddy. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Just as a human body, though it is made up of many parts, is a single unit because all these parts, though many, make one body, so it is with Christ. In the one spirit, we were all baptized, Jews as well as Greeks, slaves as well as citizens, and one spirit was given to us all to drink. nor is the body to be identified with any one of its many parts. Now you together are Christ's body, but each of you is a different part of it. The reader there, Ray Hutchinson, from the parish of St. Michael's, Ashburton. And now begins the preparation for the Gospel with the singing of the Alleluia verse. Alleluia, Hebrew for praise God. The Holy Father has placed incense in the thurible and now the deacon, Deacon Burns Huggin from Melbourne, moves to the lectern for the proclamation of the gospel or the good news, gospel being an old English word in fact for good news and before the gospel, the good news is proclaimed, it will be incensed, again recognising that here is a word to be reverenced. The deacon will be flanked by two acolytes bearing the candles, again this word is a word which is light, light in the darkness. Deacon Huggin is a permanent deacon. Most deacons are preparing for ordination of the priesthood, but he is not. He is a permanent the deacon. The Lord be with you. reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you. Jesus with the power of the Spirit in him, returned to Galilee, and his reputation spread throughout the countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as he usually did. He stood up to read, and they handed him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord has been given to me, 
for he has anointed me. He has sent me to bring the good news to the poor, to proclaim liberty to captives, and to the blind new sight, to set the downtrodden free, to proclaim the Lord's year of favor. He then rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the assistant, and sat down. All eyes in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to speak to them. This text is being fulfilled today, even as you listen. This is the Gospel of the Lord. The deacon, having proclaimed the good news, kisses the book, again an act of reverence, and says quietly, may the words of the gospel wipe our sins away. May they bring us true freedom. And now preparations are made for the homily of the Holy Father, the speech he makes taking the word proclaimed and applying it to our life as Christians here in Australia in 1986. Bringing the speech to him there is his secretary, Father Stanislav Zivic, who was also his secretary when he was Archbishop of Krakow. The theme of the homily will be the role of the laity the lay people in the church of 1986. I shall give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. Dear brothers and sisters, these words of God's promise which were spoken through the prophet Ezekiel, make us think of the words which Jesus of Nazareth spoke at the beginning of his messianic ministry. The Spirit of the Lord has been given to me. He has sent me to proclaim the Lord's year of favor. Coming from God, Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit. Precisely for this reason, he was called the Christ, which means anointed one. He came in the power of the Holy Spirit and he brought the Spirit with him. Jesus gave that Spirit to the Apostles. He gave the Spirit to the Church. He gives the Spirit to all who are open to receive him. All of this was foreshadowed when God said, I shall put a new spirit in you. We are gathered here today in the power of Christ's messianic mission. We are united in the Holy Spirit. In this great city of Melbourne, I greet you, Archbishop Little, and all of you who are gathered as the liturgical assembly of God's people in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. It is, this is not the first time that I have come to your country and to this city. I have vivid memories of the strong faith shown by the people of Victoria at the 40th 
Eucharistic Congress here in Melbourne in 1973. The host of the great event was Cardinal Knox, and I attended it as Archbishop of Krakow, a pilgrim of the church in Poland to the church in Australia. I gratefully recall the friendship and hospitality of your church. At that time, I heard people speak of the great leadership of Archbishop Mannix in this city. From 1917 to 1963, the faith had first been brought here during the last century by the Irish immigrants and the Archbishop's task was to lead his people to take their rightful place in this democracy. In those years, the church increased and multiplied, and the foundation was laid for the present lively traditions of lay initiative and activity of Catholic education and of general's dedication by the members of the church to the progress and development of this state. It is only right that we should remember this outstanding churchmen and give thanks to God for their leadership. Today, Today, I have the privilege of being here among you once more. This time, I come as a pilgrim from Rome. I bring you the legacy of the See of St. Peter which is the servant church of the whole human family and of all the particular churches in Australia and throughout the world. Yours is an immense and beautiful land, an open-hearted country, a willful, Lavish land, as your poet Dorothea Makela wrote, a sunburned country of sweeping plains and far horizons, but also a huge and mighty place of fire and famine, of droughts and flooding grains. You have met these challenges and your present situation and your freedom show that you have built well. Since the Second World War, people from many nations have come here and while they were seeking a better life for themselves and their families, they in turn 
have enriched the life and traditions of their adopted country. They came from Europe, and in particular from Italy, but also more recently from Asia and South America. They include many Catholics, and this has contributed greatly to building up the church in this land throughout this country and continent, God's words spoken through the prophet Ezekiel have taken on a particular eloquence. Then I am going to take you from among the nations and gather you together from all the foreign countries and bring you home. You will live in the land which I gave your ancestors. You shall be my people and I will be your God. The Second Vatican Council tells us that it has pleased God to make people holy and safe. Save them not merely as individuals without any mutual bonds, but by making them into a single people, a people which acknowledges him in truth and serves him in holiness. By the power of God's grace, this messianic people moves forward through history, not without trials and tribulations, seeking to build up the fellowship of life charity and truth here at Flemington Racecourse in Melbourne we gather as a part of the people of God to celebrate the Eucharist and as we bear witness to the redemptive sacrifice of Christ we give an account of the hope of eternal life that is in us. Catholics of Victoria and all Australia, do you fully realize what it means to belong to the church? Above all, do you draw sufficiently on the strength of the Holy Spirit who sustains the church in the truth and love of Christ so that you can carry out the tasks of communicating this truth and this love to the world? Do you fully realize, to use the words of St. Peter, that you are living stones making a spiritual house. Yours is indeed a great dignity. As the successor of Peter, I have the task of encouraging the particular churches to share ever more fully in the communion that is the universal church a communion with the Father through the Son in the Holy Spirit, and a communion of the members among themselves. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him singing for joy. 
know that He, the Lord, is God. He made us. We belong to Him. These words of the psalm are addressed to the whole people of God. In Christ, they are addressed to each one, to each one of us, to every man, woman, and child. They are a, an invitation to exercise the fundamental office of the priesthood of the faithful, which means to give glory to God and to acknowledge his dominion over all life. The new people of God is a priestly people that has a share in the one priesthood of Christ. Through baptism, he made us a line of kings and priests to serve his God and Father. We are a people of praise and worship, of holiness and spiritual rebirth. In brief, this common priesthood of all the baptized is expressed in two ways. On the one hand, the worshiping and adoring God, and on the other, by working to extend his kingdom in the affairs of the human family. Both are part of our Christian vocation and should not be separated. The sacrament of confirmation helps us to share more fully in these tasks. All the members of the church, young and old, men and women, priests, religious and lay people, have certain duties towards God. They are called to acknowledge his primacy in their lives through the liturgy and through prayer. The sacraments, especially the Eucharist, are bridges between the ordinary world and the kingdom of God. They are the instruments of Christ's saving grace at work in our lives. They enable us to offer thanksgiving to God for all the good things that we possess. They help us to plead for our own needs and the needs of the, of the human family. In this sense, the tradition of Sunday Mass is of immense importance. God's people are called to assemble for the celebration of the Lord's saving death and resurrection on the first day of the week, the day on which his resurrection showed forth the Father's acceptance of our redemption. To those who are drifted away from the practice of the faith, I say this, listen to Christ and you will once more discover the meaning of his love. You will hear him calling you to return to his father's house. Perhaps you fear some lack of understanding on the part of the community true the church is never perfect in all her members but she is the father's house and it is only in the father's house that you will be able to share fully in christ's gifts of love and reconciliation 
the common priesthood of the faithful, in which all Christians share by reason of their baptismal consecration, enables the faithful to offer all their activity to God as a spiritual sacrifice in union with the Eucharistic sacrifice of Christ and his church. Life with all its possibilities and responsibilities, with its, its joys and its sorrows, its hopes and its, its pains, becomes like a temple in which God is adored and his will fulfilled. The laity, in particular, are called to bring the message of spirit of the gospel into the everyday world of the family, work and leisure. When you help to make the Christian message incarnate in your culture, and when you help society to develop a greater respect for human dignity, you are fulfilling one of your tasks as a priestly people. The priestly people of God finds much to do in the sphere of social justice. The poor and the disadvantaged the powerless and unsuccessful in our consumer society, the unemployed, the sick, the young, the old, have first call on the love of the Christian community. And then there is the call of the poor of the wider world around you. Your project compassion has provided much needed assistance to others i am sure too that it has also increased your awareness of the interdependence of all god's people and what about the many forms of spiritual poverty that plague contemporary society. Will the Christian community stand firm in the defense of marriage and the family, the very survival and well-being of our society depends on it? Will the Christian community defend the gift of life from conception to the moment of death. It is not the quality of life, however important this may be, which makes life sacred, but the very fact of our existence, life is a gift of God. Man is merely its administrator within the limits of the Creator's design. If the vulnerable and defenseless are not safe, no one is safe for long. No human rights are safe in a world without firm moral principles in a world where everything is relative and depends merely on a particular opinion or point of view. God has given us our reason and his revealed teaching in order to help us recognize 
these truths and different fundamental values, if we explain them badly or ignore their consequences in public life, we will have betrayed our Christian heritage. My visit is meant to be an invitation to the ecclesial community in Australia, especially to the lady, to take a firm stand on the side of life and love, truth and justice, and the dignity of every human being. Ultimately, I am asking you to take a stand for God. What I am saying is this, know that he, the Lord, is God. He made us, we belong to him. This is the great task of the priestly people of God. I address my appeal in a particular way to the young, especially young adults. The future of any society rests with its young people. In fact, the young are the most precious possession of any society. The community is decadent when it does not want children, when it does not love them and respect them. Young people of Australia, I ask you, does God have a part in your hopes and ambitions for the Australia of tomorrow? Do you dream of an Australia in which the poor and the downtrodden, the disadvantaged and the lonely, the spiritually blind and those struggling to make sense out of their lives will be sustained by the hands of a loving God. And do you realize that God has no other hands but yours to stretch out to those in need? <clears throat> Australia needs the witness of your Christian life. Australia needs young people who will live in charity and truth, who will live just lives and bear witness to God's plan for human love in marriage. Australia needs young people who will freely make the sacrifices necessary to follow Jesus more closely in the priesthood or in the religious life of consecrated chastity, poverty, and obedience. In one way or another, Christ will certainly speak to your hearts if one form or another he will, call, he will call you to sacrifice and to service. I have been told that Melbourne is a city of movements and ideas. It has been in the forefront of social programming and more recently in the field of biotechnology. It is here, therefore, that I wish to stress 
that progress is only really progress when it respects the image of God in man. The God who has revealed himself in human history and who has revealed that the ultimate meaning of human life, every human life, is union with himself through our Lord Jesus Christ. I would, I would ask the men and women of science to make sure that they truly use their research of te and technical skill in the service of humanity, to make sure that these never become false idols if science is ever separated from its moral and ethical demands, it can never lead humanity to a better life. Humanity has already had enough experience to know that such science can only destroy the very freedom and dignity of the human person which it was meant to serve. Today, we need to listen once more to God's promise made through the prophet Ezekiel. I shall cleanse you of all your idols. I shall give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. You shall be my people and I will be your God. Today, we also need to be able to repeat the words of the psalm, serve the Lord with gladness. Yes, the Lord is good. The Lord is good. His faithfulness is from age to age. God made us. We belong to him. Our task is to serve him with gladness. This is my hope for all of you. A true renewal of spirit and life. For you, the bishops of Victoria, for the priests, deacons, and seminarians, called to minister to God's people with all the love and concern of the Good Shepherd. For you, men and women religious, who are privileged witnesses of God's love for his people. For you, the laity of the church in Victoria, called to build up Christ's kingdom of justice, truth, and love in this blessed land. May Mary be the constant inspiration and model for all you all, brothers and sisters of other Christian communions, men and women of other religions, and all people of, of goodwill alone to include you, too, in this prayer of hope and blessing. May all of you, dear people of Australia, serve the Lord with gladness. Amen. Holy Father finishes his sweeping and windswept homily, his proclamation of the word of God. In the midst of his words, the heart of faith hears the word of God himself, to which we now respond with the intercessions, the prayer 
of the faithful, God's faithful people. One of the things that most struck me in the homily was where the Pope spoke of his role as being to encourage the local church. Once again, that idea that it's not he who has to do everything, but that the, the work has to be done by us. And he did then attempt to, to relate his message in various ways to the Australian context, with those quotes from Dorothea McKellar about the, the sunburnt country, um, references to to Melbourne as a, an intellectual centre, as a place where there's bioethical research going on and which has to be seen in the light of Christian ethical principles. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, all in his and the sea. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, the God of man, the one babe with the bow, through him all things were made, for us men, for our salvation, he came down from heaven, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate well from the very man, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified on the Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he was again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into hell. He is seated on the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit. The Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge our baptism for the forgiveness of sin, the glory and resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world. The ancient words of Christian faith the Nicene Creed reaching back to 325. It's that faith which we prompts us now to people. pray. The Lord has saved as we follow him along his way of faith. Let us lift our hearts to his Father in prayer. For our Holy Father, Pope John Paul, that in his travels he may continue to announce the good news of God's love with wisdom and courage. The first uh, person to take part was Ben Jordan, a 10-year-old boy from Melbourne. And now, teenage Terry Connolly. For the church in Australia, that the people of God in our land may joyfully proclaim God's presence and create a society according to the mind and heart of Jesus, his son. And the third reader, Peter Mitchum. For all Australians, that they may respect the many cultures which make up their nation and work together for the good of all. We pray to the Lord. The fourth reader is Sister Maureen O'Loughlin. For true and lasting peace, that the peace of Christ may penetrate the hearts and minds of leaders when they make decisions 
and settle priorities. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And now Mr. Frank de Blasi takes part in the prayer of the faithful. For our young people, that we might be open to their vision, appreciate their energy, and respond to their questions and insights with love and honesty. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. The sixth and final reader in the intercessions is Peg Money. For the poor and overburdened, that their day of freedom be hastened as we strive to lift broken spirits and spread the kingdom of God on earth. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Receive the prayers of a pilgrim po people seeking to discover your will by walking in the footsteps of your Son, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. That concludes the Liturgy of the Word, and now begins the Liturgy of the Eucharist. Eucharist, a Greek word an ancient one, meaning thanksgiving. And this is the great sacrifice of thanksgiving. Gifts are brought to the altar, gifts which symbolize us, all our work, all our life. And various symbolic gifts, not just the bread and wine that will be used for the mass, but other gifts, work of our hands, work of our work, are brought to the Holy Father at this point, and to the altar to be offered to God, who is the giver of all gifts. It's the Park family who bring the gifts to the altar and to the Holy Father. Lawrence and Irene, the parents, and their children, Michael and then Lawrence Jr. But they come in the name of all of us. This is a symbolic way of stressing the family as the heart of any of our talk about the lay people in the church. The family is the heart of it all. The hidden church of God accompanying the bringing up of the gifts. Again, pointing to, to the fact that we are all the church and that these people who bring the gifts are representatives of us all. The theme of this Mass is, is the laity. That stress that the church is the whole people of God, not, not simply the hierarchy. And this family are their representatives as we have the Son Church of God. It's also a moment where His Holiness can sit down and receive a little shelter that he certainly deserves after standing at the top of the podium and uh, being rather windswept throughout the homily. The crowd here at Flemington uh, isn't too perturbed by the wind, of course, on ground level. It's not nearly as strong. Nor is everyone, I might add, wearing a mitre, hardly a, a good hat for the wind. Father Dennis Hart there in the centre of the screen, the assistant master of ceremonies, and it's he who's planned all the liturgies of this national tour of the Holy Father. He now takes in his left hand the crozier and moves to the altar to begin the liturgy of the Eucharist.
Blessed are you, Lord, the God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God, be God forever. <clears throat> Having taken the bread and the of this water and wine, offered it to the Father, in the divinity of Christ, Himself. The Holy Father now takes the chalice in which are mingled water and wine, symbolic of the way in which our life, the drop of water, is mingled with the life of Christ, the wine. The chalice has been made by brothers Dan and John Flynn, silversmiths of Kyneton and country Victoria. The Flynns carried on their father's business after the Second World War and have been commissioned in more recent times to make works of silver presented on behalf of the Australian people by the government to British royalty and other dignitaries. The chalice has a theme of strength around the Pope's reputation as a builder of bridges. It's decorated with opals and ebony. And now again, the Holy Father takes the incense from the deacon, Stuart Hall, and places it on the hot coals in the thurible. And we see the incense rising from earth to heaven, sign of our prayer, sign of the reverence that that prayer embodies, the voice of our praise. The Holy Father blesses the incense and will now incense both the gifts and the altar on which they're placed. And in the background, the choir sings the motet by Adrian Batten, O Sing Joyfully. Father bows to the crucifix and incenses the great icon that stands at the heart of Christian faith, the crucified Christ. Recognizing that it is he and that action of his which stands at the heart of what we do here. And now the celebrants and the whole congregation are incensed, again recognizing the sacredness of this gathering where two or three, let alone two or three hundred thousand, are gathered in my name, there am I in your midst. service bring the water to the Holy Father who now washes his hands symbolic of the purity required of him who leads the church in praise to the altar of Christ's sacrifice as the deacon incenses the congregation brethren that our sacrifice may be acceptable to God the Almighty Father the invitation to pray and the community's glad acceptance of the Pope's invitation God our Father look with love on the gifts of your people 
help us to understand what is right and good in your sight and to proclaim it faithfully to our brothers and sisters. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now begins the greatest of all Christian prayers, the Eucharistic prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your heart. Thanks to the Lord, our God. Father, all-powerful and ever-living God, we do well always and everywhere to give you thanks through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through his cross and resurrection, he freed us from sin and death and called us to the glory that has made us a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people set apart. Everywhere we proclaim your mighty works for you have called us out of darkness into your own wonderful light. And so, with all the choirs of angels in heaven, we proclaim your glory and join in their unending hymn of praise. Now begins the hymn of praise, the great cry, Hosanna, Hebrew, Save us, Lord, you who can.
Father, you are whole indeed, and all creation rightly gives you praise. All life, all holiness comes from you through your Son, Jesus Christ, our, our Lord, by the working of the Holy Spirit. From age to age, you gather a people to yourself, so that from east to west, a perfect offering may be made to the glory of your name. So, Father, we bring you these gifts. We ask you to make them holy by the power of your Spirit, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate this Eucharist. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread, gave you thanks and praise. He broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, which will be given up for you. The Holy Father shows the consecrated host to the four corners of the world. Christ for all. When supper was ended, he took the cup. Again he gave you thanks and praise gave the cup to his disciples and said, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. It will be shed for you and for all, so that sins may be forgiven. Do this in memory of me. Now the proclamation of the faith of Christian people. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. His glorious resurrection and ascension into heaven. And ready to greet him when he comes again, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look with favor on your church's offering and see the victim whose death has reconciled us to yourself. Grant that we, who are nourished by his body and blood, may be filled with his Holy Spirit and become one body, one spirit, Christ. May he make us an everlasting gift to you and enable us to share in the inheritance of your saints with Mary, the Virgin Mother of God, with the apostles, the martyrs, St. Patrick, and all your saints on whose constant intercession we rely for help. The Bishop Lord, of Ballarat. May this sacrifice, which has made our peace with you, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Strengthen in faith and love your pilgrim church on earth, your servant, Pope John Paul, our Bishop Francis, and all the bishops, with the clergy and the entire people your son has gained for you. Father, 
Hear the prayers of the family you have gathered here before you. In mercy and love, unite all your children, wherever they may be. Welcome into your kingdom our departed brothers and sisters, and all who have left this world in your friendship. We hope to enjoy forever the vision of your glory through Christ our Lord, from whom all good things come. Through priests move among the crowd now as the Eucharistic prayer finishes and the rite of communion begins. The priests bearing with them the consecrated hosts, the Holy Communion. Constraints uh, of time, space and numbers make it impossible to give communion from the chalice the to all. In the words our Saviour gave all. And that's why only the concelebrants take the chalice. Hundreds of priests will give communion with a blessing given in the special papal form at the end of the Mass. and grant us peace in our day. In your mercy, keep us free from sin and protect us from all anxiety as we wait in joyful hope for the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. said to your apostles, I leave you peace, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and grant us the peace and unity of your kingdom, where you live forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us offer each other a sign of peace. The peace now shared. Christian belief is that there can be no peace or union with God unless there is peace and union among us. Therefore, as we come to the table of the Lord, we make the sign that there is peace among us, that there might be peace with him. I'm told that for Australian Catholics there is no essential difference between a papal mass and mass in the humblest bush church. To the eyes of the faithful, the underlying reality is the same. In each Mass, Christ becomes present to his people so that his power flows into them.
the song was the cry that the Lord grant us his peace, he who is Redeemer, who is the Lamb slain for the life of the world, because unless he give us his peace, then there is for us no peace. Holy Father, they're mingling with the wine, the consecrated bread, or a tiny piece, representing unity with the bishop. In this case, our unity with the bishop of Rome, the universal pastor. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, by the will of the Father, the work of the Lord, Holy Spirit, your death, breath, brought life to the world, by your holy God and blood, free me from all my sins and from every evil. Keep me faithful to your teaching, and never let me part from you. With the Holy Father at the altar, there are not only Bishop Mulkerns and Archbishop Little, but also Bishop Daly, the Bishop of Sandhurst, and Bishop Darcy, the Bishop of Sale, the four bishops of Victoria. Bishop Daly there receiving the host from the Holy Father. Bishop Mulkerns. And finally, Bishop Eric Darcy, who for 25 years taught philosophy in the University of Melbourne. Also among the concelebrants is the retired and now blind Bishop of Sale, Bishop Arthur Fox, so well known and loved by so many in Melbourne. This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am worthy to receive, but only say the word and they shall be healed. May the blood of Christ bring me to everlasting life. now the song Strong and Constant, written by the Australian MSC priest, Frank Anderson. see some of the 114 people who will in fact receive communion from the Holy Father. They're ordinary people selected at random by their parishes and include one each from the migrant communities. There are no VIPs among them.
in Christian faith, all who share in the one loaf, the one bread, are one, even though they are many, like the pieces of bread now shared, but broken from the one loaf, the bread which is Christ, there is the unity that exists among us. And now the great motet by Palestrina, Sicut Cervus, like the deer that yearns for running streams, so my soul is thirsting for you, my God. Many of the people who will receive communion from the Holy Father are disabled. People from all walks of life. But representative of the general population. Gibbon, sorry. Around his neck, Edwin, yes. the Holy Father wears the white linen band with the black crosses, which is known as the pallium, which is a sign of his authority as bishop, and in particular, particular as Bishop of Rome. Other bishops, or major bishops, like Archbishop Little, wear it as a sign of their communion with him, the Bishop of Rome, who is the universal pastor. People from the migrant groups are also represented among the folk who are receiving Holy Communion from Pope John Paul. no special order for them to uh, receive Holy Communion, but we will no doubt see some of them, including John and Flora Jones of Melbourne. For them, today the Mass coincides with the 50th anniversary of their wedding at Our Lady Help of Christians Church in East Brunswick. Some of the people taking communion on the tongue, others choosing to take communion in the hand. This is an off option now offered to Catholic people. Until quite recently, the only way of receiving communion was to receive it on the tongue, but now the choice is given. And there we see Irina Ahin, one of the disabled people, a victim of cerebral palsy, being carried by two seminarians.
Some of the people who played a special part in the organisation of the Mass are represented. We uh, have also had Andrew Gibbons, a 13-year-old of Vermont, and his father Bill is the truckie who transported all the containers for the podium, as well as carrying out other work on the site. I know many people will be watching in Mary Knoll today. Mary Knoll by Anana Goon to see the McDonough mother and, I beg your pardon, the McDonough family, Mr. and Mrs. McDonough and their five children. A day to remember for Irina Ahin. among them to some of the teaching brothers and sisters who have made such a magnificent contribution to the life of the Australian church through the course of its life. Helen and Jerry Van Dinter of Bright have brought their son who is severely handicapped and he will also receive Holy Communion. It's again powerfully symbolic of what Pope John Paul has insisted upon so strongly that every human life is sacred. It's Laudate Dominum by Hans Leer Hassler. Laudate Dominum, Latin for praise the Lord. The people to receive Holy Communion is Catherine Flynn of Kyneton, whose family designed the magnificent chalice which we saw earlier. 
was made by brothers Dan and John Flynn, silversmiths of Kyneton in country Victoria. We believe around 200,000 people have assembled here at Flemington for the Mass. Another representative of the various migrant communities. In all his visits around the world, the Holy Father regards these moments where he leads his people to the table of the Eucharist as the heart of his visits. This is not just one among many great moments. This, for him, as for all Christians in faith, is the heart of it all. Because this moment is, in the words of the Vatican Council, the source and the summit of Christian life. gift of finest wheat. view there of the skyline of Melbourne forming the backdrop of this mass and how right that is. This is not a moment apart from the world but a moment of life for the world. sings of the call of God, the call that he makes to us, his church, to go out into the world, to spread the good news, to make peace. The Holy Father, having surrendered the Eucharist, returns to his chair, rests in prayer, somehow right in a moment like this. And it's certainly a moment of fulfilment for Mr. Gerard Smith, the Melbourne architect who designed the podium and its theme reflecting Victoria as the garden state. time you will see some of the people listening to the proceedings on little radios. Indeed, 
the organisers have set up a special radio station on the FM frequency band, which is providing an audio coverage of the mass for those who are able to pick it up, and they can pick it up clearly right in this immediate vicinity. Now the Mass moves to its conclusion with the prayer after communion which will be followed by the Papal Blessing, a blessing given not only to those at Flemington but to all who are watching and to the whole nation. Let us pray. May the holy gifts we receive give us strength in doing your will and make us effective witnesses of your truth to all whose lives we touch. We ask this through Christ our Lord. In giving the blessing, the Holy Father wishes to bless all here present, especially the sick, those united with us through radio and television, and any articles of devotion which you may have brought with you. Michael Wood, the leader of the Congregation in Song, moves to the lectern. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. May the God of all consolation bless you in every way and grant you peace all the days of your life. Amen. May he free you from all anxiety and strengthen your hearts in his love. Amen. May he enrich you with his gift of faith, hope, and love. So that what you do in this life will bring you to the happiness of everlasting life. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.
the last word of the congregation, a word of thanks for this moment, which has been the gift of the God whom we thank, and as always, the applause. Recognising the marvellous gift that the presence of the Pope has been in this moment as in these days. It is my great joy that I was able to celebrate this Holy Eucharist together with you, my brother bishops and my brother priests. It is my joy that I have thy, that I have been able to celebrate this Holy Eucharist for all of you, the people of God, of Melbourne and Victoria. You are all Australians, but many of you I are greeting me along the streets saying Evviva il Papa! <laughs> the famous linguistic skills of Pope John Paul. And so I wish to answer in the same language Io voglio salutare tutti questi cittadini australiani che provengono dall'Italia e voglio portare il vostro saluto ai vostri concittadini venendo dall'Italia saying that he would like to greet all the citizens of Australia who come from Italy and he would like also to take their greeting back to back to Italy and back to the people in Rome particularly. God bless all of you, all the city of Melbourne, all Victoria and all Australia. I am very grateful to all of you who have prepared this wonderful celebration. I am very grateful especially to the choir who inspired our participation. And to the providence for this very beautiful day and this very strong wind. At least he didn't lose his hat. <laughs> Praise be the Lord. And now the Holy Father moves to the altar, which, as he did at the start of the Mass, he will kiss, again, a sign of the reverence due to God and to what he gives on that altar. And again there sounds the hymn of this papal tour, God of Peace. The cross, as always, leads the procession the leader of this people on their journey is the crucified Christ. A 
And then the book of the Gospels, again, the good news is that which goes with us on this journey. father wears on his right hand flashes in the sun the ring which is symbol of his marriage to the church the bond that binds him forever to this people who are called in the tradition the bride of Christ Father now moves from the podium down to greet the concelebrating clergy. There in the centre of your screen and moving from the screen now is Father Roberto Tucci, the Italian Jesuit, who is the organiser of all these papal tours throughout the world and the former director of Vatican Radio.